she has a lot she has a lot to teach us. And I really encourage you guys to speak up, ask questions, fill the chat with your observations. We will be monitoring it. This is an interactive session. So one of the reasons I'm excited about this training in particular is that Jessica or JMR as she is known, um, she can really address things kind of across the spectrum of engagement, moving from the benign and kindly, kind of widely accepted engagement practices that we all know to concepts and strategies that sound frankly more challenging to the status quo. You know, on the on the low hanging fruit end of engagement, you know, it's outreach, it's it's a one way street often, it's holding events to showcase your content, it's developing sources for your beat. But moving along the spectrum, eventually we get to something that's really more engaging, like the stuff we're talking about, collaborative, collaboratively addressing community concerns, really integrating engagement into your organization's culture and something, a kind of a two-way relationship with your community that offers mutual benefit. Ultimately, it's something, you know, along the lines of power sharing, and that's kind of a scary concept where the media, we have had the power in the past, there's a power imbalance and we're changing that up. We call it community engagement. Jessica calls it something else, participatory journalism. And I'm gonna let her explain. You know, with all the hand wringing last week with Adi Cornish's ex exit um, from NPR, Joshua Johnson, a former NPR reporter tweeted that public media, quote, often felt like working in a walled garden. Well, this kind of stuff that we're gonna be talking about today, this is how we frankly begin to break down those walls. So um, welcome to Jessica. Thanks for being here, everybody. Yes, and thank you for inviting me. I am um, really honored to be with you all. I have been following America Amplified and I am so inspired by it. I think it is a game-changing initiative for all of the public media system. So I really appreciate your time, all your efforts, and I'm, of course, really stoked that you're here um, today. I um, want to give you a sense of what we're going to be doing in this session. Again, we're looking to make it uh, interactive. Whoops. Let's not get too far ahead. Um, but what we're going to do, I'm going to walk through a few community engaged reporting projects that I've done at CAP Radio, kind of lifting up some of the key ingredients that made it successful, and then create spaces for you all to talk about what you're hearing, um, what stands out to you, and how to make this uh, presentation and some of the ideas actionable to you. For those of you that kind of appreciate having a, a, a takeaway and also something to look at while we go, Matt's dropping in the chat a Google Doc that kind of gives the key points I'm going to go through, um, also gives you links and resources, and, um, and an agenda. So you're welcome to look at that now or use it as a takeaway. So I want to start with this idea of participation. And I want to do that by having you all think about an experience you've had where your participation was really meaningful, where the experience was really good for you. Um, you know, you might cast your mind to uh, a recent team meeting or a um, station uh, team project, maybe an activity at home or in the community. But think about when you've done something in a group recently, you have participated, you have engaged, and it's really gone well for you. And when you have that in your mind, Matt is drop, dropping in another link um, that I'd like you to go to, to a tool that I like to use, although I'll admit it's getting a little bit more glitchy these days, called Answer Garden. And what I want you to do is start doing a brainstorm. You do that by thinking about one of the ideas. Um, uh, does anyone wanna call out like what, just one quick idea, what made participation meaningful in an experience they had recently? Just give me something to start working with to show you how this works. 
there was a lot of give and take, a lot of feedback from the other people participating. Right. So what I want you to do is write an idea, keep it on the short time, short uh, side, give and take, and you hit submit. And then it will come up into my, oh, oh, people are already going. Yay. So you can see, go ahead and just start typing in one idea, like a post-it storm, one idea, hit submit and start putting in your ideas. If you see someone else's idea that you agree with, you can click on it and hit submit and it will make that idea bigger. So we can start making a word cloud and you can kind of pick out both what you've said and what other people have said that you think make participation in a group activity meaningful. So let's go ahead, um, let's go ahead and I can't actually bring up the music easily now. So I think I'll just leave the music off. I think there's about 20 or 25 of you. So please go ahead and add your ideas. What makes participation meaningful? And I'll call them out as we go. And I'll refresh this in case I'm missing some of them. Okay, let's hear some ideas. Oh, look at that. Here we go. So everything from seeing impact and feeling valued, feeling heard, feeling seen, BIPOC, BIPOC folks in particular, feeling heard and seen and being able to ask questions, common ground, receptivity, collaboration. Let me, let me uh, refresh again in case there's been a couple of more. All right, we're building, okay, respect better feedback, diverse voices, fresh perspectives, providing a service or making a contribution, sincerity, having a real impact, asking and offering, give and take, asking and offering, um, connecting with others, making change. Let me try one more refresh before we move on. Yeah. So people are starting to click on the ones that are most important to them. So you can start having a sense just within this group of the qualities that make our participation meaningful. And some of the big ones that you all are pointing out, the biggest one front and center is feeling seen and heard, right? And the next one is having an impact in some way that your participation makes a difference. You know, that could often be in terms of shaping what you're doing um, the way what having an influence, uh, give and take, having there be reciprocity, mutuality, a way in which it's mutually rewarding for everyone involved, collaboration, and the idea of diverse voices. And I also see follow up. So those are all very important. So these are the things I just want to lift up right here. If you're looking at this word cloud, these we're tapping into your experience, right? We're building practice from your wisdom. These are the things that make your participation meaningful, right? When you engage in something, this is probably what makes it relevant to you, useful, maybe exciting, transformative. Um, and why I want to lift this up at the front part is these qualities of meaningful participation folding them in to our engagement process, whether it's in the reporting or the distribution and circling back, folding these in is one of the key ingredients in my secret sauce. Let me get to it, right? Um, the more you can, and I'll take a screenshot of that and put it in the Google Doc so you'll have it, for a future reference, but the more of those qualities that you weave and bring into your process of engagement, um, the more it's gonna be um, meaningful for others. So that's kind of my first tip in the secret sauce, design for meaningful participation. A couple of others, create community partnerships. Um, oops, let me do this. Uh, help meet partner and community needs through your reporting and share stories and resources back with them. And one of the things that I want to, um, one of the reasons I want to bring this up 
And let me just go back for one second to this slide around participant, whoops, back, not forward. Um, one of the reasons that uh, I wanna bring this up is that when you um, bring these qualities into your community engagement projects, um, this is, this is this kind of work is what Elisa alluded to in the front part. A lot of people call it community engagement, citizen powered engagement, people powered engagement or people powered journalism, engaged journalism. I call it participatory journalism because it really centers uh, what makes participation meaningful, which I think is really the foundation of engagement. It also has a lot to do with this other idea that Elisa um, kind of talked about at the beginning, this notion of power sharing, right? Um, how do we, by power sharing, how are we sharing our knowledge, our tools, our resources, our networks, um, and the benefits? Uh, and a lot of the ways we do that are through those qualities that you just mentioned, helping people feel heard, providing a service, making an impact, having a give and take, creating things that are mutually rewarding, right? Giving people uh, influence in the process and the outcome. That's all, there are all different kinds of power sharing. Um, so what I wanna do is segue now, now that's kind of our big picture, Right now, I want to kind of bring through what these different ingredients look like in some community engaged reporting projects. Let me just do a quick look at the chat to make sure there are no questions or ideas that I need We're to. Good. Okay, then I'm gonna keep going. But we All do right. encourage you guys to throw stuff into the chat. I'll be watching it. Yeah, great. So you watch and you tell me if there's anything. It's so nice to have additional hands. All right, whoops, I'm, gonna, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let me get back to come back. All right, so the first project I wanna share with you is called Hidden Hunger. This was a reporting project fueled by community engagement that tells the stories of people who are coping with food insecurity and those working to alleviate hunger in Sacramento County, which is the area that I'm living adjacent to and where we're headquartered at Cap Radio. Sacramento, if you don't know, is the, like the breadbasket for California and actually a lot of the country. But even though we grow most of the food for our state and nation, there's about 20% of the people who are going hungry on any given day. So there's a real problem. So how did we get started You know, with this uh, community engaged reporting project? First, what I did, is I had one-on-one -on -one conversations with key leaders in Sacramento's anti-hunger movement to really get their take uh, on the issues and local solutions. From there, I invited those leaders and folks that they suggested, other uh, folks from education, government, uh, community groups, and we came together with journalists in a series of stakeholder convenings. I had two of them, about 50 people each. And during those listening sessions, I invited the stakeholders to name and frame the issues, right? That's a first step in sharing power, right? Not, not us just only in our editorial meetings, but really inviting people at ground zero in this issue to help us name and frame issues, solutions, um, causes, impacts, story sources, all of those things. Of course, they're generating those ideas and seeing us <laughs> as reporters take notes on their ideas and also talking about how we plan to bring in their thinking, invested them, right? That's how we were sharing power, invested them in the success of the project and got them really excited to continue. So a number of them then continued by forming project partnerships with us. We worked with four uh, anti-hunger coalitions and we then built an advisory group with about 12 folks that were vetted and nominated through those coalitions. And then together, 
uh, we, again, we created a community engagement plan that really spelled out what are the goals of this project, what are the roles, responsibilities, activities, um, and how, how will their idea shape newsroom reporting? Okay, again, other ways that we were sharing power. Um, and of course, we involved them. This was about, they, we met with them every month for about a year. Uh, and not only did they help, you know, develop and co-create all aspects of the project, but they gave ongoing editorial feedback on the stories that we were developing. Quick now, question, and, pretty please. Oh, yes. Um, when you were pulling together your initial group of stakeholders, were these folks that have either worked with you before or knew of you before, or were any of them completely new to being involved with you? That is a great question. Um, so most of the people that I did one-on-ones had heard of CAP Radio. Uh, none of them I had worked with before. The um, people in the convenings for this project, I'd say I'd say ninety percent had heard of us. Um, I don't think any of them had met with us in this way. Thanks. Um, yeah, those are really good questions. The next project I'm going to talk about is different. So I want to make sure and get to uh, answer your question because it created some differences. Um, thanks for the question. All right. So, uh, so I want to, so I was talking about ways we we're sharing power in the development and the implementation of the project um, in terms of making it mutually rewarding so that it felt particularly meaningful also for our partners and advisors. We did two things. These are two ideas that came up through their, uh, our conversations with them. The first is that we uh, create a mobile story booth. And we did that because our coalition partners wanted to really bust the stereotype of who was going hungry in Sacramento County and why, by showing a wide range of actual images of people. There was this kind of stereotype that there were like, you know, all people of color, all junkies, all people who, you know, are somehow, you know, living off the system, something like that. When in fact, the data that we knew and they knew was the vast majority of people actually in Sacramento County using food banks were Caucasian well and a lot of them had jobs. So they wanted to bust this stereotype. Um, so what I did is I set up this mobile story booth. You can see these two college interns. By the way, I'm an engagement staff of one and I often have just you know one or two interns. So all the stuff I'm telling you is kind of what can be done at that level of uh, st staffing. So I set up this mobile story booth and let me jump over to show you what we created. Let me pull down my screen so you can see a little bit more of it. Um, so I set up this mobile story booth with interns and our photographer, Cap Radio photographer. We uh, went to um, food banks all around Sacramento. We invited our partners, you know, again, sharing power, it's gonna be my refrain. Uh, they helped us select, actually they selected where we went and they helped recruit storytellers because this is a very vulnerable population. And, you know, we wanted to work with them to identify people, but we also had a booth. So a lot of people just joined in because they wanted to have a voice or they wanted to talk to us. And, um, we created this, uh, we asked, let's see, let me grab, there's, you can see what it looks like. Um, one of the things, uh, oh, there we go. One of the things our partners really wanted, not only to bust the stereotype, but they really wanted uh, stories, right? Short stories that they could use for building understanding and empathy in their education and outreach and social media. So this whole site is designed um, to do that. And then um, and the second thing, so the mobile story booth was one piece that we did. Then a second thing that we did is, let me get back up to the top here, let me go to resources. Um, oh, not resources, events. 
So let me, uh, one thing I'll say about the mobile story booth, we got about 50 stories, we made that mobile story booth, and it was also useful and rewarding for journalists, they listened to all the stories to get a larger context for their reporting, it was instant pre reporting for them. Um, and then we Jessica? were able, yeah, we had a raised hand. Okay, let me finish this last sentence, I will get to it. Okay. Um, and we were able to bring uh, many of those story booth stories into the documentary. And then we had a broadcast. Yes, raised hand. You wanna call on that person for me, Elisa? Well, it disappeared. Funny, oh, sorry. I don't know why. Um, this is Sue from WUSF in Tampa. Hey, Sue. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Did you have any grant funding or anything like that to help you with this effort? Yes. So um, at the beginning, so to do this work, to do uh, all of that, like all of those like um, development work, you know, from the one-on-one -on -one conversations through the broadcast, we did not have a grant. Um, what happened was as we were going towards the broadcast, what our partners really decided they wanted next was a way to bring people together face to face to interact with the stories and each other and make meaning about it and have some pathways to deeper involvement. Um, and so because I had you know, four coalitions that represented about 70 groups and I had an advisory group that could write letters of support, because I did all of that, we were able to get a $25,000 discretionary grant from a area foundation to have, the, um, to have the conversations that I'm about to show you and to create resources. So we didn't start with a grant, but by doing engagement, we were able to get a grant. Um, I also wanna note that um, Robin um, wanted to know the process to gather feedback throughout publishing our stories. What was, the, what was your process and how did you gather feedback throughout your publishing of stories? Were editors and reporters involved? What type of changes happened? Yes. <laughs> so um, the process to gather feedback uh, and publishing throughout the stories in those advisory groups, I'm a big fan of what I call rough cut, um, rough cut uh, airings. Uh, this is something that often makes reporters and editors nervous, but I found over time it's worked really well. Reporters uh, attended the advisory group meetings. We picked selections of stories in their work in progress format. So not finished, work in progress. We'd play stories. And then I, my two questions are, does this ring true? If so, tell us how. And what is missing? Tell us what. So that's how we gathered process on the stories throughout um, in our editor in our advisory group meetings. Uh, and what type of changes happened? What we would find out is sometimes we might find out that our ideas were were not as nuanced. Uh, or we would have to be more careful with vulnerable populations around how something was positioned or language. And those were things that the advisors would bring up and then we could make some changes. Thank you for the question. Um, and how did this measure impact for this project later? Yes, let me write that down and talk about later. Um, on the Hidden Hunger website, I'll just, uh, Robin, let me just show you on the about and anybody on all these sites, I'm a super big fan. You can go ahead and, um, where is it? There is, I think there, I have, um, I will figure out the impact report. We have a whole impact report, which I thought was here, but uh, let me make sure I'm not missing it. Hmm. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. There is an additional page that I'm missing because my my website, it, my screen share. There it is. See that about an impact. So if you want to go to the impact page, you can download our impact report and the model I developed from it. All right. So let me pop back to events and let me give myself a little time check. Um, so let me just give you a sense. I know a lot of you are interested in events. Of course, this looks wild because it's in person. 
everything we can do in person, we can pretty much do <laughs> most things uh, online. Um, but let me give you a sense of what this looked like. Let me move things over a second. Um, Okay, so this was these were big conversations, about 125 people. I said I got a grant, so that's how we could do a lot of this work. Um, we shared power by having our partners um, select the stories and speakers. These were conversations that blended lightning presentations, radio stories over a shared meal. Coalition partners hosted the tables and they had info zones where people could then go after the conversations to find ways to get more involved. Welcome to our community conversation. Hunger in the farm to fork capital. We're so glad you're here tonight. I'm actually gonna pause it here because I am looking at the time and I wanna show you a few more things. Um, the biggest one on this site, because I wanna get to this idea of how we share things back, right? Uh, is that um, on this website, this became one of our ways of sharing stories back. And what we did is we created a resource page in addition to the story pages where we had all of the tools anyone would need to facilitate and host a similar conversation on hunger and our partners created a resource list that can help anybody who also wanted to have a similar conversation. So let me just, I know this that looks amazing and it was amazing. Let me show you share some lessons learned. Community events, when they're large like that, they require a lot of staffing. Um, so I was only really able to do that because I had all of those partners and advisors, right? They actually helped plan, promote, and staff the event. Um, events are also, they require a lot of lead time. <laughs> I tend to want to like, let's go. But like marketing's like, hold your horses. And um, if you're doing collaborative planning and power sharing, you gotta go slower. So I, I ended up really um, moving a little fast and I would just recommend that give yourself like a couple months lead time. Reporters, another lesson learned, you know, all the reporters were in the room, they were acknowledged, they were a part of it, but we totally did not think to have them like listen because that was a massive listening post and do follow-up stories. So that was a kind of a big missed opportunity. Um, let me just check and see. Okay, let me let me give you one more quick uh, quick example, and then we're going to put you into breakout groups to do some talking, and then we'll come back for questions. So the other uh, project uh, I wanted to highlight is called Place and Privilege. Um, this really explores the affordable housing crisis in Sacramento, California, probably happening in a lot of the communities you're in. We looked at the crisis through the stories of people who were hit the hardest or living on the edge. And this project that was again, fueled by engagement, generated an eight part podcast, an hour long documentary and a series of interactive, uh, in a website with a lot of interactive voices. So we followed the same process, right? We had one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with key leaders on the ground that led to stakeholder convenings where leaders came together with our journalists to talk about and name and frame what are those issues, what are the solutions, um, stories, sources. Um, look, then from there, we built partnerships with folks who were in the room. Sorry, I know those are a little hard to read, but AARP, Local Government Commission, the Housing Alliance, the Library, the Center for Regional Change, um, and uh, Sacramento County Public Health. And then we formed the advisory group. This um, let me tell you, and then what we did is, again, we created our engagement plan, roles, 
goals, roles, responsibilities, timeline, activities. I'm a big fan of MOUs and charters, so everybody's clear on what that is. We all sign it. And then again, this time we only met for six months, so less than hidden hunger. But similarly, we, you know, work together to shape the whole, um, the whole reporting project um, from, 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 seat, from stem to stern. Uh, and there were a couple of ways that this one is different. And I just want to highlight those. Getting back to the first question, I forget who asked it, um, about- that, uh, that was me, Rima Dial. W-S-H-U. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so this is where um, on this advisory group, we had, you know, partner organizations, representatives from those organizations in the group. But we also, I also went and recruited individuals, right? Developers, people who are formerly unhoused, people currently in workforce housing, tenant organizers, so we had kind of a big range. So all of the people I recruited had never heard of Cap Radio, right? So, um, and so, and also, so that was different. And then having partner organizations and individuals um, was also very different. Um, again, this was shorter, that was different. And how we made it meaningful and mutually beneficial and how we shared stories back, that was also different. So here's one way we made it meaningful and useful. All of our advisors and partners, very diverse range. We actually had 35 of them. So a little, a little much, would not, re would not recommend that many. But we had 35, about 20 of which came to every meeting once a month for six months. And they really thought what was important um, because so many of them hadn't heard of public radio, didn't, you know, news and radio, like that's not where they think change is gonna happen. They thought change would happen on the ground by bringing people together, particularly people on the front lines, you know, and people who um, basically are public media um, audience, right? The influencers. And so we had a series of story circles with, which brought those groups together to tell very personal stories about when having a house made a difference in their life. And I'm just showing you in that Google document that I shared at the top, uh, there are links to these resources, but we had this series of story circles and that was something that came out of the conversation that made it meaningful for the partners. The partners hosted those in low income housing, um, developments actually, and neighborhoods. The other thing that was different is at those, and this gets back to how we share the stories back and make things useful for participants and partners. At the story circles, we set up a photo booth. And what we did is we invited anyone who wanted to after the story circle to come have their portrait taken and we gave them a copy of their portrait. So they had this beautiful copy professional copy of their portrait. Um, and they could also tell us their views and experiences on housing that they wanted other people to know and understand. And then I put this together uh, and did an Instagram takeover for about two months during which we had we were rolling out the story circles and of course tagged participants and partners. So that's another way that, was, that um, this project was different and how we kind of shared stories, shared power, and made it mutually rewarding for people involved. Let me talk a little bit before we go to our breakouts about what we learned. The first I kind of queued up earlier, when you have a large range of advisors, like in number or in range of perspective or experience, they have really different needs and availability. And it makes a much richer conversation and a much richer experience and a much richer project and, and, and stories. But you have to keep in mind that it's gonna require more of your time and energy to facilitate that. Um, story circles, we did them at the end and they were so powerful. That's really where trust got built and connection to each other, but also to our station. So, uh, maybe try those at the beginning of your project before or in place of convenings. They're smaller, they're more intimate. They're a lot actually, frankly, easier to organize. 
Um, and then Instagram, it is a winner. <laughs> People feel seen, you know, those qualities of meaningful participation, they feel heard, they feel respected. Um, there's a give and take. So that was really helpful. Uh, when we're working with advocacy groups, uh, those, the, I guess what I'm thinking about is maybe, are you asking about Joshua, like the people who are advisors and partners and how mm -hmm. we work with them? Yeah. So if you're an advisor or a partner, you're generally not in the reporting. That's one thing. Um, and then, um, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and that is really important because, you know, sometimes uh, we'd have to be thoughtful about who we're inviting onto the advisory board and partnering with, because if reporters feel that they really want to talk to those folks um, on record and have it in the reporting, we have to be thoughtful about that. Um, if we do decide to bring them in, we might have to let people know, you know, like, you know, um, Jessica Maria Ross, who uh, leads violence prevention at Weave, um, who collaborated with us on this project, you know, we might have to say something like that. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, you want to go to other questions, Elisa? Yeah, Rima has another question. How does the newsroom see your work and have, have there been tensions that needed to be resolved? <laughs> to get tested and needed in lockdown. Yeah. Um, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. So, um, so I would say that it comes in waves. Um, I'd say the people that see my work and really see the importance of it are executive leadership. Those people aren't in the newsroom. I think that reporters and editors who um, they look at my work in broad brushstroke as oftentimes something, first of all, they look at it as engagement as opposed to in, uh, community engaged reporting. Sometimes they separate it out um, and that's an ongoing challenge, right? Like you do engagement, <laughs> you plan the party and we'll show up and do the work. And so I do have to do a lot of awareness raising around how, um, you know, who I bring into the room, why they're coming into the room, the trust that's been built, and the reason they'll even, you know, work with us and actually circulate our stories all comes through the engagement, the depth and access to stories. If you're in documentary, that's a big thing, right? Getting depth and access. You don't just show up and get that. That is uh, uh, all on relations. So there's education I always have to do ongoing. What I will tell you as my hot tip and that I have found to be true is to find the editor and the reporter who are open and willing and start there. I have found over and over that once I work with the reporter and the editor and we go through the reporting process, it becomes very clear how this enriches the reporting, how this brings so much to the work and how it actually saves a lot of reporting time, right? It's a lot of the pre-reporting. Um, and I'm looking at your question. Yeah, so there's always tension, not always. There, I have experienced ongoing tension, um, mostly because I want everybody to see the beauty and wonder and value that I see. And um, they want me to see how much they have to get done in a day on deadline. And it's just a dance. You know, reporters are under an incredible amount of stress and pressure. And they um, work on urgency and deadline. And engagement is the opposite. It's the slow food approach. So there's always going to be tension. And how you build trust with reporters and editors is how you make it meaningful and rewarding to them, again, those qualities, that's what's gonna help it be successful. Do you wanna take another question before we go to the next one? Um, there's one, Mark Simpson from Maine uh, just mentions that there's a cultural shift to tackle in the newsroom to move closer towards engagement and growth and sustainability down the road. I just think that's a good point. <laughs> 
He says yeah. it feels like a feels like a cultural moment to talk with our development folks about the need to build community engagement alongside news gathering needs. Yeah. yeah. I want to say to everybody that right now, until we get the chat resolved, feel free and you got share. It. Oh, you got it resolved. Yeah. So this is a good way to learn from each other. If you have something you have done in your newsroom to help um, manage and negotiate that tension, um, please drop it in the chat. This is a way for we can learn from each other. And then I'm just going to look at a couple of key things and see if there's anything else um, that I want to make sure and highlight. Great. OK. Um, and thank you, um, Matt, for resolving all the tech stuff. And we'll have a breakout group um, in about 10 minutes. So let me give you one more um, example. And let me get here. Let me DJ my windows here. There we go. So here's another example I want to give you that is like the polar opposite of the two that I've just shared, right? Hidden hunger and place and privilege were um, urban, suburban. Um, they were six months to a year. Um, they were, uh, they, uh, had like a, um, a very formal process and formal advisory board. This project, the rural reporting project was very different. It was done at, the, at that crazy scary moment of the pandemic in April, May of 2020, uh, shelter in place order was happening and it, um, rural communities weren't being impacted yet, but it was starting. And Cap Radio is headquartered in Sacramento. Uh, we wanted to know what was happening in areas that we serve a couple hours from us. So this is the project that we did. And I want to just flag, Rima, I haven't forgotten your question. Um, I'm going to get to it. So I just want to flag. Thank that. you. <laughs> um, so here's how the process looked different. Um, again, I did start with uh, making a call, but instead of a bunch of stakeholders, I called one person. I had worked up in these counties, Plumas and Sierra counties, again, about three hours from Sacramento. So I had a lay of the land, kind of like you probably all do with a number of communities. And I knew that there was this one person, Holly George, that was like beloved across the fault lines. Dems, repubs, you know, loggers and tree huggers and fish fish kissers and hunters and, you know, arts people, everyone in between. Like she was the person, the maven. So I called her and I pitched her on the idea of doing some kind of reporting project so that we could be really listening to and serving um, the rural communities that she's a part of. She was totally excited about the idea and worked with me to bring in um, a couple of other folks to have a very informal listening session. And the folks that she and I brought in were from Cooperative Extension um, and uh, the health departments from both Plumas and Sierra counties and both the arts councils. And pro tip, this is a model I would replic replicate in every rural community because you have all of those um, organizations in the county. Um, so we formed very, we formed project partnerships. Um, and uh, then we formed an advisory group. And we brought into the mix our sister station, NSPR. Shout out to Adia, who might be in the room. Uh, North State Public Radio, uh, sister station to the north. We found out through the informal listening sessions and the project partnerships that Cap Radio Signal doesn't get to certain pockets of these counties, but North States does. And in a lot of places, they overlap. So why not collaborate? So we did, and what we did together very quickly, we had six meetings, 90 minutes each over Zoom, and we created an online survey. Um, we felt like that was the safest, quickest, and most direct way to connect with people who were in lockdown. Um, and Sharing Power, our partners and advisors, they helped us decide, develop and decide on which questions. Um, they uh, workshopped the language so it was relatable uh, and translated to rural communities. Um, and then they put together this outreach plan, super simple. 
huge list of all of the um, organizations, networks, institutions that they would want to re um, respond to the survey. And then they just, they picked which ones they would personally reach out to. And that's how we did the outreach plan. I never set a foot in the community. I never called anyone. I did make um, a project FAQ uh, and outreach talking points for them. So we kind of had shared, shared uh, understanding and communication. What I just it say also in the, in the Google doc that accompanies this um, talk, you will see links to many of these things that she's talking about. So yeah. Just so you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do we make it meaningful and mutually beneficial? Um, so I shared the survey data, right? I, we were The partners join on because they're trying to serve their communities. They want to know what's going. They need data. That's part of why they join. So making it useful to them gave them the data. Um, we also involved them in our editorial meetings, and they actually um, looked at the survey data and helped us determine and prioritize what the, were the information needs, the interests, and what was unique in the data, right? Because we asked not just about what people's concerns are, were, but like what was giving them comfort or moments of inspiration and what that looked like, both of those things, needs and you know, comfort and solutions were, were things that uh, they had insights on from being on the ground in rural areas that our rural editors and reporters didn't pick up on. Um, they created the story budget with us and then we produced the seven part series and we were able to work with um, North State Public Radio to uh, have them on both of our stations. Um, so that's, that's how we kind of made it meaningful and beneficial to everyone involved. Um, okay. Sharing stories, oh, hey, sharing stories and resources. We did things a little differently because we had a survey. Um, we asked people, uh, where would you like us to share these stories with you? Gets back to that question Rima asked at the beginning, like, you know, do these people know you? <laughs> do, they, do they work with you? Have you worked with them? I didn't, I didn't know these people. I hadn't worked with them. And, you know, in these rural communities, our data told us that we didn't have a lot of um, penetration, a lot of people following using us. So, you know, we could put these stories on our station, they might never even see it. So we asked them in the survey, how can we get them back to you? They told us so many Facebook groups. I, I mean, it's amazing. There was like 12 Facebook groups, right? For uh, They wanted you post them in these Facebook groups. They also have three community newspapers. It's an older community in this rural area. So they were actually looking at the newspapers and they wanted us to publish them there. So we formed partnerships with the three newspapers. So you can see in the bottom left, they would we provided the content and images to them and they could uh, reprint our stories. Um, we posted uh, the Facebook groups that allowed us to post. Uh, we posted our stories every week after they came out and then we did a newsletter. I mean, it was like the world's like, you know, simplest newsletter, uh, but it was just like a hi, you know, here's the latest story, here are updates, give us feedback. And we sent that to all like 250 survey respondents. We did that every week, all three of those every week. And um, we learned partnerships, right? We had an incredibly high response rate we had this survey out for like just a little over a week. And in that time we got like 200, about I think about 250 responses, you know, in that crazy moment of lockdown where there were lots of surveys. And I think that's because the, the survey came from people's neighbors and community leaders. Um, that weekly email newsletter and Facebook post I talked about, of the 6,000 page views that the story received, unique page views, about a quarter of them came from those um, story links, right? And most of the readers were first time visitors to our website. So this is a way that showed us that we were connecting with new audiences and serving them. Um, we did have challenges um, having our um, stories reprinted in the newspapers. They all reprinted it some, but not all of them. And when we did an evaluation to ask them why, they told us, you know, story length, public radio story length is a bit bigger than community newspaper story length. Some of the tone and language 
wasn't super relatable. Um, a lot, sometimes we had lots of pictures and graphs and they don't do pictures and graphs. So one learning, if you do this, is that you'll need to build in some time and willingness to uh, retool some of the stories. And it takes a dedicated a person. Uh, this gets back to granting. I actually got a small grant from the listing post to have someone work with me for 10 hours to do this. Elisa, over to you. Yeah, we have a few uh, good questions here, Jessica, from Rima, surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, she, she asks suggestions on how to start this if we don't even have the capacity to hire even one person. And I, Rima, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but Mark Simpson agrees and he would like an answer to that. Um, I, I, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> like like where, where, where do we start if we don't have the capacity to, to um, clone someone or hire someone yet? I, I would say you start with the same process you just decide you you just scale it to what you can do so for example um let me see if i can get back to just so you can have a visual um let me get let me just go this way so let me use let me use this one this is the best example right um i didn't have a lot of time or or energy not energy i have a lot of energy I didn't have a lot of time or resources. So I called one person, called one person. Now I could have called five, right? Hidden hunger and place and privilege. I called and met one-on-one -on -one with about 10 to 15 people, right? Um, for coffee for an hour. So I could scale that back. I could meet with five people right? One-on-one -on -one for an hour. I could meet with 10 people for half an hour. I could call one community leader. Um, another thing, you know, you can have informal listening sessions. You don't have to have big community convenings. You can get, you know, 10 people in a room over lunch, providing them the lunch um, and ask them a couple of stories and have your reporters in the room. And you could stop there, right? Um, and you could roll into that conversation, not just naming and framing stories, issues and solutions and stories, but asking them, okay, if we did these stories, you know, what would be the top priority for you? Um, when you look at any of these topics, are there information resources that we might be able to provide? So you, you can just basically, um, do, do the same process and do less. You don't have to have partners. You can have one partner, you can have two partners, right? Um, Elisa, did you have another? Yeah, and I was gonna say, as, we, as we've said previously, you, even if you do a little bit of this, it's better than doing none at all, right? There, there's one thing. And then the other thing is, is, Rima, I know this is a huge priority for your station. Somebody's gonna have to stop doing something, you know, if, yes. if this is a priority. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, somebody's going to have to stop doing something. We have a, we have another good question, I think, um, from Mark Simpson. Curious how important you would rank journalism experience for community engagement staff. Does it matter or how much does it matter? Great question. I think um, community organizing or civic participation um, or event uh, development management creation are probably more useful direct translatable skills uh, than um, journalism. I think that it's helpful if they have journalism. And if they don't have journalism, then there needs to be ways in which you have an editor um, working closely with you. This has happened with me. I'm not a trained journalist. So I have to work with an editor and I have to have a good understanding of when I might be blurring the lines and I have to run it by him first. Um, when I work with reporters, I have to build in time to say, this is my plan. What do you like? Any red flags? Because again, I, I tend to work outside the box. Um, so I would say it's helpful if they have a journalism experience, but more helpful if they have facilitation, organizing, people, bringing people together experience. Should we try breakout rooms again? Let's do it. We'll do short breakout rooms because we're running low on time, but I want to give you guys time to really talk together. Um, 
So here's what I'd like you to do. Um, I'd like you to just take some time. We'll probably do just five minutes again, two people, if that's okay, Matt, just two people. Um, maybe, a, maybe just talk about one idea you heard that you'd like to try and how you might get started. Okay, one idea you'd like to try and how to get started. Again, it's five minutes, take 30 seconds to drop in and say hello, introduce yourself. Um, we'll broadcast it when we're halfway through. So you both have time to talk and you'll have a, a minute, we'll call you back. Um, so you have a minute to kind of wrap up your conversation. Okay, let's go. Maybe. While we're waiting, um, I'm just going to um, mention a few quick things. Uh, whoops! Most of the most of the uh, projects that I work on, it gets to someone's question. Um, we uh, it's built into our budget, right? My my salary. And the intern stipend is built into the budget. So it's not like we're going out and getting a bunch of additional grants. So that's something I wanted to highlight. And then Rima, your question around um, tying the mission, uh, the, the tensions in terms of mission of uh, community engagement and the newsroom. Um, I think what's really important is to, and again, I may not have written your question down correctly so we can circle back to it, but what I wanna highlight is this is, even though you all are on the leading edge of doing this across the country, this is still newish. Um, the idea of sharing power is not like native to newsrooms or reporters. And the idea that community knowledge is as important and as useful is not what J schools teach people. So everything we are doing is going against the grain of the culture that is embedded in our organization. So if it's really hard, there's a reason it is not you. Um, and to get help with making it less hard, I think first of all, there needs to be a champion at the leadership level and then a champion at the newsroom level, either your managing editor, the editor who's working on a project with you, um, or your or a reporter. But usually, the it's usually got to be an editorial level. So, Rima, I hope just, I uh, break in here. Question. Matt, is it is it going to happen, or do we want to just move on to kind of group chat? You're muted. It says everybody okay. is assigned to a room. Um, and a few people are in their breakout rooms, but oh, not. That's so weird. How many, let me see, how many people do we have in this main? We have people in breakout rooms? There's a few people that have joined their breakout rooms. All right. So, and let me, how many people do we have in the main room? Let me see if I can find that out. Uh, there's about 22. Oh, so yeah. The rest of you guys didn't get any invitation to a breakout room, huh? Sorry. All right, hold on one second. Let me just try something real quick here. We did troubleshoot this, but do better next time. Hold on one second. So while I'm gonna, I'm gonna check on something, but for the 22 of you in the room, God, it keeps wanting to go to my last slide. Hello, let me go to this. Um, if you would take a second and just write some ideas down while I'm just about on these two questions. Um, Matt, if you wanna broadcast these questions to the groups that are there. And, all right, so for some reason, uh, yeah, I am not enabled to put you into groups, otherwise I would for some reason. Okay, so let's do this. Um, everyone can see the chat now, right? Yep. Okay, 
I'm sorry, you 22 who are in the room. Um, yeah, I probably do need to be a co-host, Mark. I actually am a co-host. I don't know why. So, uh, so let's do this. Those of you in the room, could you just share with me one idea that you'd like to try? Give me kind of a sense of where this landed for you, how this might translate into what you're thinking about doing, just to start our conversation. So Rima's interested in story circles. Oh, with Local Voices Network. Okay, great. Um, I noticed a lot of people were interested in story circles from the last chat. So I wanna talk about those a little bit. What else? Oh, let's see. Um, Mark, you're also interested in story circles. Great, so we'll kind of segue into that next, I think. Photo booths, oh, right on, okay. And let me ask you this, uh, as, as, you're, as you're putting these ideas in, my follow-up is gonna be, what's one way you can get started? So, uh, oh, Adam, hello, nice to see you. You're working with County Extension, bravo, right on. Photo booth, anyone else have an idea they wanna put in the mix? The Instagram takeover and the resources page. Brittany also wants to look at story circles and portraits, right? Um, the WhatsApp group, that's really important. Um, you know, it's Maria, Maria, what kind of audience are you working with that, that you were gonna use your WhatsApp group with? Maybe she's not hearing me. Um, Latinx. Latinx. Latinx, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of data that shows it. it's a good idea, right? You wanna meet people where they are. Your advisors can often tell you where they are. And then, um, and then you can figure out where to share the stories back. Um, same with Facebook groups. Um, so then let me ask this group, uh, let me do one thing. Matt, uh, could you be monitoring the amount of time for the breakout groups and just broadcast? Um, they're probably halfway through. They're probably closer to done actually. There was only two people that ended up making it into the rooms, so oh. I've already brought them back. Oh, you have? Yes. Yeah. All right. So let me just do this. Let me let me uh, let me stop the screen share so that we can have a gallery and we can all see each other for the last uh, twelve minutes or so. Um, and I invite you to come off so we could see all your fabulous faces, see the America Amplified across the country. Um, and um, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna highlight a few things I heard, uh, and then I'm just gonna take questions um, with the time we have. I wanna, I wanna first of all tell you that those of you who are interested in story circles, um, Instagram takeover, there are links in that Google doc uh, to articles I've written that talk about how to do all of that more in depth. Um, and Elisa, do you have a question? No. Okay, so your hand is up, just so you know. Oh, it is. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so what, what's come up a bunch in the chat is people's interest in story circles as something they might wanna try or the Instagram takeover, uh, the photo booth. Um, and I want to flag that those are probably things uh, you picked that you can do without a lot of grants and without a lot of extra staff, right? Likely you all know how to do an Instagram. Um, you know, if you can get your photographer, set up a story booth, you know, um, and take those pictures and have, I have a little form that I ask people like to write questions on. And that's how I put their questions, their ideas and image together, or you could just do a quick interview. Um, and let me just open it up to questions. I could, I could kind of go on, but I wanna make sure I just, let me just open the floor. Questions either about how to get started with the idea you want to apply or questions um, about anything that stood out to you. And I'll just say that, you know, if there's any, Blair, Blair Waltman has raised her hand. Um, if there's anything in particular that you're really jazzed about, but you're like, well, how do we even begin? 
just reach back out to your contact at America Amplified and we will get you the resources and the support you need to make it happen. That's what we're here for. So Blair Waltman has raised her hand. Yes, Blair. Their hand. Hi, everybody. Um, so my question, this might be a little bit kind of further down the trail, but um, did you guys have any trouble with uh, just kind of garnering community engagement and feedback on just any of these levels of projects? I know we've been doing a little bit of this and what we've noticed is a lot of times it's the same folks that will come to events and discussions and, and feedback sessions um, because they're already engaged and they also um, might have a little bit more free time than other folks that maybe have kids or work different shifts or this and that. So um, um, did you guys run into that and was there a solution you found that worked well for that? Yeah, super great question. Um, what I generally did is I, I use my own networks, um, either doing research online or calling other community um, leaders at, to brainstorm a list of people that, that I should contact and invite. So usually I'm inviting people to something. It's not like put out like, hi, come talk to us. Because if it's hi, come talk to us, it's usually this, the people, you're already meeting people where they're at and serving them. Um, you, so I usually do invite only, that's one solution. The second is if I'm gonna do an open call, I also pair it with the invites. Um, so what I do is if I know housing is a big issue, I know all the people are gonna come. So I can brainstorm. And again, I could do it with one person, five people, but brainstorm like who's usually missing in this conversation? Who do I need to reach out to? Can I say you told, you gave me their name and number? Can you do the introduction for me? Those are some solutions. You, you do need to do the legwork to make sure that the people uh, that often aren't heard. Um, and then when you get those people in the room, you often have to do some facilitative work so they feel that they belong and they're comfortable speaking. Right on, other questions? And by the way, you all have lots of tips. Anything you would add to, for Blair from what I said, please add in the chat. Please um, add in the chat. Brittany, you um, had an idea about how at um, Indiana Public Broadcasting, they were able to work with the tensions between the newsroom and the engagement. Maybe you could give us an example of that. Please. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. I'm sad my colleague Robin had to jump off for another meeting because her team is really the ones that like, like I don't know if they pioneered it, but they're definitely the ones uh, at our station who started it and it was really successful. So uh, we definitely like just yoinked it for the side effects team. Um, so what they do is before ever any story like really gets deep into the reporting phase, they have something called a green light meeting where they have um, the editor, the digital editor, the reporter, and the engagement specialist come together, talk about the story pitch, talk about, okay, who does this primarily affect? Who um, bears sort of the disproportionate burden of what we're talking about in the story? And how do we make sure we get those voices in the story? who needs to hear the story and how do we get it to them? So these are all questions that they're starting to think about before the reporter even like has an interview that they record. Um, oh. There's also a question of what engagement possibilities are there for this? And sometimes it's as simple as like, here's a list of organizations we think would find this reporting important. We're just gonna email it to them when we're done. And sometimes it's more like a, um, one thing we're hoping to work on in the next couple of weeks is we have a story about like a milk bank um, and moms not being able to afford milk bank milk and what they do to get around those costs and how that's sometimes not super sanitary. So what we'd like to do is have like a, a, a sort of presentation with some of the maternal health like organizations around town to be like, this is something you might wanna keep an eye on. Here's the reporting that we did. We just wanna make sure that like it's, it's top of mind for the people who are um, working on these issues. Um, but basically like before any story goes like, the reporter and the engagement specialist have a talk together over how they think that relationship needs to work and what they think that reporting needs to do or where it needs to go after the story is out. That is so brilliant, Brittany. And if you wouldn't mind, I would love to see those questions in the chat so we can all just pull from them. One yeah. thing I've done that's um, a little similar is I've there's often um, a story pitch process and pay like a list of things that reporters have to do on their story pitch. And what we've done kind of like Brittany is we've just a couple of questions, you know, like who, who does this story serve? You know, 
you know, who is this, who is this story for, you know, how will you, how will you, how can we get this story to them? Um, and like, we can ask a few questions. It's not as in depth. So I'm going to take a page from your playbook, Brittany. Thank you. Any other questions about the idea you're excited about and how to get started? Yeah, Miles. Hey everyone. Yeah, I'm really excited about the idea of inviting people to something. Um, I am coming from a position of kind of being tangential to the newsroom, not a journalist, not a reporter, but in a coordinator and a community engagement person. And mm -hmm. I've wondered like if you've any of you have had success at sort of a a group based event, something to invite people into in this age of in person events not really happening because it's kind of struck me as a barrier. Um, not being sure how to facilitate invitations to a, a virtual space. So if you have any tips and tricks about that um, along the lines of community engagement, I would be happy to hear about them. Yeah, um, I know that uh, last year America Amplified partnered with the Local Voices Network. So mm -hmm. Elise could probably get you that information. They actually have like a whole facilitator guide and process miles so that and they help you if you partner with them. Um, they actually record it for you. And there's a way in which your reporters and editors can use and learn from it's like a listening post, but also you can report out of it. Um, Miles, are you on the Gather platform by chance? Uh, recently familiar, but I haven't gotten very far with it. We'll get you, we'll get you in, Miles. It's it's an invaluable resource of so everybody trying to do this stuff. Yeah. There's a uh, I, I mentioned it because there's a um, there's a face to face channel, and I'm I'm. I'm the, I'm the curator this month and I'm stoking a conversation about tips and tricks for virtual convenient virtual meetings because I do believe we'll be virtual for another couple of months. So that's a place to, to send you. Um, there is also a, an organization that's amazing called Play on Purpose, Play on Purpose. They have monthly virtual connection labs where you can um, participate and learn and they have a whole if you become a member they have a whole bunch of exercises and videos you can look at um, liberating structures um, I will try and write these in the chat as I talk about them these are just places you can go for resources um, yeah great other questions or ways that we can all support you in getting started with the idea that you're interested in? We could probably take one more question. Well, liberating structures. Yeah, they're great. They have a book I used to use back in the day, but they've gone online. We will share some of these resources with you guys that you will have this Google, this Google Doc that um, Jessica created that kind of is a companion piece to this presentation. I apologize for the um, technical difficulties. We will work on that. Um, I think despite the fact that we couldn't go to breakout groups, you guys were very interactive and very, um, you seemed pretty engaged and I appreciate that. So. Um, Thank you to Jessica. Let's give her a round of virtual applause. I hope it was valuable for everybody. I hope you were inspired. I certainly was. I've been inspired by her for a long time, and I think that she's an incredible resource. And uh, don't inundate her with your, with, your, <laughs> with your emails and stuff, but she does love to help, so it's a good thing to know. She's on our advisory board as well, so she's invested. Thanks so much, Jessica. Yay.